constant noise going on or you're in a place where it's very crowded, please do mute until you're ready to say something. Okay, that's important to know. Um, now, I'm going to introduce our host today, and I'm really excited about this because um, Shay Cox is, yes, yay, Shay, is a true visionary in the veterinary profession, and she is really intent on reimagining um, the delivery of pet care in the world today. She is a hospice provider. She's also co-founder of the One Health Company, and she is obsessed um, with the idea of creating unforgettable experiences, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So um, she comes at this with a, a true, um, true compassion in her heart. Um, she also has an extreme interest in telemedicine and changing the way veterinarians are able to establish the VCPRs within their practice and bring um, better, more compassionate, and more um, accessible care to the general public. So with that, to grab your beverage, I'm going to introduce Dr. Shay Cox. And Shay, if you'd start with our toast. Great, thanks. So there's a little bit of a, a work up to the toast. And the <laughs> thing was just, it was so, of course, right, imagine. Um, it was so exciting to be immersed at the ATA and just talking about technology and being surrounded by all of these incredible conversations around telehealth and, and what's possible. And in contrast, when you look at veterinary medicine, we seem to almost have the, the exact uh, opposite reaction to that. And one of the things that stuck with me is that even the, the idea of we're no longer at a space where we know it's coming, we're at a space of it's here and we need to do something about that. And one of the keynote speakers, as, as Chad and Jessica also heard, is there's three things we can do with this. And one is we can deny it, so we can put our heads in the sand like a little ostrich. We can get bigger, so we can do more with more people. Or we can be different. And that was the part that was really cool. And so my toast for today is to be different. Cheers! 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 Cheers. And it's my coffee glass, not a wine glass, so. <laughs> so does, does everyone know what the ATA is or is there, is there kind of people don't know what it is? A show of hands if you guys aren't sure you know what the ATA is and Shay could give us a quick, all right, yeah. Shay, maybe give a quick little overview. of. Okay, so it's the American Telemedicine Association and it's the leading telehealth industry on the human side. And there's over 10,000 members all across industry, healthcare providers, technology, uh, integration of, of healthcare systems. And they actually run the, the largest uh, conference in the entire world. They also have one of the busiest website portals and the number one e-newsletter. So they're very embracing, embracing their, their message. So the big thing is, you know, why is this important uh, with the ATA? Why should we stand up and take notice? Why should we even be interested in what's happening over there? And I think one of the biggest things with this organization, and part of the reason why I think the veterinary profession should pay attention, is that we're given a literal snapshot of 10 years of, of history. So human medicine has done all the work. It's there for us to, to pick and choose from. And we have the benefit of knowing what's worked really well. And we also have the benefit of, of what they do uh, to make things better. And that's a really unique advantage that we, that we have. One of, the, one of the key takeaways, and I'll just lightly touch upon this, but it's something we all talked about as, as a group. So Chad and Jessica were at the conference with us was that human medicine is now beginning to switch from calling things telemed, telehealth, tele, tele this and that, to virtual care or connected care. And I think a really interesting approach in thinking maybe as veterinarians, maybe we should start with what they're finally figuring out 10 years later, as opposed to going backwards 10 years and starting with the idea of telehealth. So just something that I thought was, was interesting. So as you can imagine, there were probably more, well, there were a lot more takeaways in the four days that we spent there than we can actually cover in this 25 minutes. So going through my list of everything, I picked out two highlights that I thought were, were of interest and might be helpful just because it's a little more on the periphery of telemedicine as opposed to the obvious parts of telemedicine. 
And those two insights are one, that we need to start looking at telehealth and the delivery of care from the perspective of the consumer. So put on the consumer lens and look at everything through, through the consumer. So stepping outside of veterinary medicine and really getting an idea of what that customer is doing delivering care. He was looking to other industries to learn how to do things better. So not just veterinary medicine itself. I think, you know, we often get so knee deep in the weeds of, of veterinary health care that that's what our perspective is limited to. And a really big takeaway was looking at other organizations that have nothing to do with health and seeing why they're so amazing at, at what it is that they're doing and taking those pieces and applying that to medicine. So those are the two things that, that I wanted to, to bring. So questions or comments yet at this point, I just sort of rambled on a few minutes. I did mute a few lines, so you'll have to unmute just because there were some sounds. So you'll have to unmute if you do want to jump in. So uh, something you and I were talking about as we were, you know, kind of downloading on everything that you learned while you were there um, that I thought was really fascinating was the application of um, the name telehealth versus connected care or um, virtual care. And some of the things that human medicine have found there. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I, I mean, I truly found that fascinating. As you said, let's not reinvent the wheel and let's not lag behind. Let's take advantage of what they've learned and be, be a jump ahead of that. So I'd love to hear more about that. So it was, this was brought up during one of the keynotes and it was based on a lot of money being invested into research on what the consumer wanted to hear, what they wanted it to be called. And you know, looking from the perspective of the medical doctor or the veterinarian, that makes sense to us. And that's, it, that's the direction coming from us to them. But when these major organizations did research around what clients wanted to hear, the, the resonating uh, number one thing that came back was connected care. So that's you know, what we want to say as veterinarians is telehealth. What people want to hear as the consumer is connected care, something that means a little bit more, more gentle, more resonating, more, more partnership. And I think that's a really important clue as to, as to what we should be doing if we're looking to meet the needs of, of what our clients are. So, you know, even, you know, we're at such an infancy really of, of launching these types of uh, technologies and integrations to our healthcare, that maybe we should think about starting with this as opposed to starting with what's just always been comfortable and, and pick up where healthcare is discovering they're, they're needing to go. That's, that's more of the elaboration, but really, you know, they sunk the billions into getting this, this information. We have it, let's use it and uh, you know, move forward with that. Struck me because when we, you know, many of us on the, on um, the, um, right now it's being usually done at night. Oops, we are there. Okay, many of us on the the meeting here um, today really are involved in creating the messaging, the languaging. You know, whether through the different kind of businesses that we're in, or if we ourselves are talking with, um, you know, with our clientele. So I think understanding the kind of words that resonate with the potential clientele can really move us light years ahead much more quickly. So I, I thought that was that connected care concept was was something very interesting, something that I hope we in veterinary medicine will listen to and, and actually use. Well it's funny you say that because the one thing that in our pilot one, Brenda, if you remember, we had concierge medicine, which was a completely different use of the language, right? And the concierge medicine means something very different to me than telehealth or potentially this connected care. So it is, again, something that's, I think we're all trying to figure it out. It would be great if we all got on the same page. I'd love some industry perspective on that, John. Your point of view, et cetera, would be great. John <laughs> Dillon. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, I got to unmute you. Hang on. There you go. Well. I missed a question. I'm so sorry. I was, I was actually, I was on a different topic. I was. Oh, and I'll, I'll ask you about this, Shay. Um, I'm really curious about your perspective on the role of insurance specifically with how that plays, uh, you know, in the adoption of, of telehealth in the human space and then the pet space. 
because I know that a lot of major insurance providers will subsidize that cost in uh, in the human space, but not in the pet space. But I'm so sorry, I, I missed your your question. No, that's okay. Let's go on to that on the human um, side. Of the insurance perspective. I'm. Uh, I just realized I'm blushing on uh, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> So we can see that blush. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't play it off on a tan. Um, but I, what, what was the question? I, I missed that. Um, well, no, I was just, I, I'd like to hear first what Shay says about the insurance and then we can back up if we have time. Sure. Okay. So, well, the, um, the question that was asked was the idea of calling, calling telemedicine more connected care in the industry and starting with that and how it would be perceived. Uh, on, the med on the veterinary medicine side of that. The insurance question is that, th I think that's what they're struggling with in the human health care as well, is how to get things subsidized from an insurance perspective, provider reimbursement, all of that. So there's, there's, there's still a lot to work out, but I think the key takeaway is look to what's, what's working. And on the human side with insurance reimbursement, it's such a different animal than veterinary medicine because insurance mm -hmm. pays for everything. Whereas the majority of veterinary patients, it's, it's client paid. Um, but like whisker docs, they're working with an insurance company to become wrapped in as part of, you know, as part of their package. So there's there's ways there's ways creative ways to integrate this and as pet insurance is trying to grow beyond you know the small percentage of pet owners I think that this would be a very smart way to to uh, meet, combine forces and actually provide better care more care and be a win-win situation. And then the question, John, that we had for you was, in, in your perspective, you know, as, as you are providing after hours care, mm -hmm. um, talking the client language and the idea of connected and how that, how that resonates with um, the clientele compared to tele, telemedicine, just curious about your, your, you know, your experience with what you're learning there in your own business. Um, I think I, spot, there would have, we I think there would have to be a big marketing push. It would have to be concerted. Um, or coordinated between, you know, the after hour care, telemedicine providers in general. Um, I know that the mobile corollaries are here with, um, with Fuzzy too. So I'd be curious about their opinion, but I think it's, it's a, I, I love that term connected care. I just, um, I think there would have to be some education for clients to be aware of what it means, but I, I think it, it sounds really good. Definitely. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I agree. I, my perspective, I guess, from Canada is that we have a fair number of government-based telehealth services. So everyone here understands the terminology telehealth. You can call a nurse on Ontario telehealth at any time. So from that perspective, I think telehealth is quite well understood here anyway in Canada. I don't know, maybe connect. I love the term connected because obviously having played in that space a bit, um, it's so much more than telehealth. It's connectedness, it's sensors, it's everything. Um, but, you know, from a, I agree with John, I mean, you'd have to market that pretty significantly so you don't have confusion as to what you're really talking about. One of the things I would add is uh, listening to the dialogue and a couple other the keynotes at the ATA meeting. Uh, they talked about this concept of, and they were using terms like virtual care and connected care kind of in a similar vein, mm -hmm. uh, but they talked about it really being a hybrid model and, and a hybrid between taking the telecommunication aspect of it in combination with the in-person aspect of it and really talking about those benefits that we derive, because we do that in our own lives, right? We're having this virtual meeting right here using some type of telecommunication device. Uh, we've also met in person, many of us individually, and our relationships now across everything we do are formed in this sort of hybrid model. And the ability to really showcase that, I think it gets you into more of a dialogue around the connectedness that we're trying to create. The other thing it brought up was, and uh, Dr. Yellowlees, who was the, the outgoing president of the ATA, uh, he's a psychiatrist at UCLA, 
and he's been doing telemedicine services for a really long time. Uh, he actually used the example, it cost him $170,000 to do his first telemedicine consult. And we all gasp, right? Wow. Well, that was many years ago because that's what it costs you to use that technology. Today, we can use it via our phones. And what do our phones do? They create connections between us and the rest of the world. So I think this whole idea of connectedness, I think, is really, it resonates. Um, Shay didn't mention it, but uh, Joanne Jenkins, who's the CEO for AARP, um, many of you probably have recognized that organization. Um, you know, it, it is a... What are you saying there, Jack? <laughs> because our grandparents are all part of it, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right? So exactly. our grandparents all sign. That's why they want to go to dinner at five o'clock every night, right? So they can go get their ARP discount. And But when you think about that, there's 38 million folks that are part of that membership group. It's the largest nonprofit organization. And they are so enthralled with this that they're really out there doing a lot of this research to understand from a consumer point of view, what is that lens? And they recognize that it is that connection. It is that connecting even just in the language itself. Um, the fact that you're actually able to bring people into this dialogue because you're connecting with them, not because you're putting some piece of technology. And I know I talk to a lot of technology companies. I talk to a lot of veterinarians in this industry. And many of them will say, well, you know, we're not the quickest to adopt technology in what we do. Or, oh, that's just good for the millennials, right? No, the people that are embracing this technology are people like all of us that say, hey, you know what? It makes my life easier. Uh, so I think we, as we think about this in the veterinary profession, we do, to Shay's point, we have so many opportunities to leverage what human healthcare has done. Um, and we also have the luxury that we're in a business where we don't rely upon payer provider relationships. Uh, we, we get to deal directly with clients. And sometimes that's a limitation but they also make choices with their dollars. So um, I think if we don't embrace the technology piece of this, uh, we are kind of missing out on the opportunities that are sitting right in front of us. Excellent point, excellent point. Um, did anybody else have a quick comment to anything that um, Dr. Dodd had to say there? So I, this, is kind of a, this leads us into another conversation that Shay and I were having earlier, and that's regard to thinking outside veterinary medicine for some of our business models, um, specifically thinking about what Walmart is doing now, putting veterinary practices um, into their, their stores and th talk about watching consumer behavior and having an audience that's basically walking in the door every single day. So um, Shay or, or Dr. Dodd, I don't know if either of you want to elaborate a little bit on that because that was a topic of discussion um, at the ATA as well. It, it was and uh, a, a, an interesting one. So you know, kind of bypassing the rest of the, the lens of the consumer just for, for time's sake. Uh, one of the keynotes that we went to was looking at what other organizations are doing. And I'll briefly uh, summarize the, the many comments I was going to make, but to put it in a nutshell with perspective to Walmart and their opening veterinary clinic doing things, the, the staggering statistic of that was that 60% of all Americans walk through a Walmart at least once a week. And so it's, but it's brilliant. So Walmart is understanding that the consumer wants to be met where they, where they live their lives. And so what are they doing? They're, they're meeting that need. And, you know, I think it's one of those things where we can ignore what's happening. You know, IQ plans to have beyond these 20 stores in Walmarts, a thousand uh, veterinary clinics by 2023. But what they're doing, whether we like it or not, is extremely smart. We're meeting them where, where, they're, where they're going. So how can we combat that in a sense of providing that same going to them where they live their lives as a veterinarian and as a practice? And you know what, they, what people want is accessibility, affordability, reliability and uh, relationships and that's what Walmart's providing so it's, it's similar I don't know if anyone's read the book um, if I if I ran my hospital like Disney or something to that effect but it's it's taking away getting outside of veterinary medicine and looking to see successful organizations how they're doing it and marrying that over into into what we're doing it, that's essentially how I started my, my own practice, my hospice practice, and it's, it's, the formula makes so much sense, and I don't know why it's so difficult to, to, 
to embrace. Um, so it's, that's, I'll say one more interesting thing was that, you know, when we look at organizing and, and developing our businesses, we so often look at it from the lens of the veterinarian and not the consumer. And an interesting point around this or a story that was used to illustrate this concept was that, and I'll change it to be a pet parent instead of a child, but a pet parent wakes up, they see that their dog has gotten sick, they vomited on the floor, that's the scenario. You ask the veterinarian, what's the first thing that goes to that client's mind? And what they say, um, the veterinarian says is, oh, if I were the client, I'd be thinking I need a doctor. And if you ask that same question to the client, what do you need now? They say, not I need, to, I'm not, I need a doctor, but I need to figure out what the problem is. And it's such a subtle nuance in, in where the brain goes first, but the fact that the brain goes to, I need to figure this out, that's, that's, the key, that's the key point to all of this. Where they're going to figure it out is the internet or you know, asking where there's immediate connection. And if we're an isolated silo or practice and we don't provide them with that immediate connection, they're going to go elsewhere. So I think a way to challenge this and sort of have the Walmart model is to be able to have telehealth as a, as a tool to be able to immediately connect with our clients. And I had a really interesting conversation um, via text with, uh, with Jess and Robert while I was at ATA. I was asking them about case use studies and because they have an amazing service where they offer 24 uh, seven telehealth answer and response to all of their members. So they're, they're doing it, they're living it. And one of the things that, that Jessica ended on, and actually I wrote this down, I'm just gonna quickly try and find it in here if I can. Actually, I've been all over the place. Essentially what it was was that we're able to intervene in a timely manner and be able to provide guidance right when it's needed. So it provides a lot of um, things aren't that, uh, clients aren't that having as many issues. So, and I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs. <laughs> They're on the other half of the house. Um, I was going to say, would someone please mute their dog? And then I realized it was yours. So that's probably not a good idea to have you mute. We do have a couple of questions here for you as well. So I'd like us to make sure because we're, we're about one minute from our 25 for people to jump off. So Brenda, why don't you uh, walk through those? So. Yeah, yes, exactly. So and then we can circle back to a couple of things. But um, Chad, there, were, there was a question here for you to help clarify regarding how AVMA defines telehealth versus telemedicine. Can you elaborate a little bit on how they differentiate the two? Yeah, great question. So really, um, and most of the organizations try to stick with this, this same nomenclature. Think of telehealth as being the umbrella that sits over all this, because that might include things like your connected devices, your mobile health. Um, it would incorporate things such as teleconsultation. So if Dr. Cox and Dr. Dodd had a consultation together, that's teleconsulting. Um, it does also incorporate this idea of tele-advice or tele-triage, which is oftentimes what's used in the context of the non-veterinary client-patient relationship dialogue. Um, but really, they try to use the broader term of telehealth to be more encompassing of all that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, Carrie, you had, you know, posed that question. Does that, does that get the information out there that you had hoped that would be, or did you have further questions on that? Oops, Thank you. Me. Okay, got it. Okay, great, great. Didn't mean to call you out there, Carrie, but I thought just in case it, um, it's interesting too, we're going to be actually having, we are at that 25 minute mark. So um, if anybody has to drop off, we certainly understand. We appreciate that you joined us. And if you have additional questions, you know, please let us know and Shay will answer them after the fact. Um, we do have a few more minutes. Um, to hang around and continue this conversation. If you want to stay for our after party, please do. I think there are a couple of um, issues that we or, or comments that have come up that we'd like to discuss in a little more detail. So please do hang around and spend a few more minutes with us if you can. All right. So comments, questions, speak up. Everybody's unmuted. That makes me think people have things to say. So, John, did you get your answer, John Dillon, did you get your answers uh, with regards to the patient relationship? There was the question of if the uh, uh, DPR 
exists in the human medicine versus how we've got our, you know, um, uh, uh, VCPR with regards for uh, animal health. Does that exist in human? So, you know, one of the differences, oh, go ahead, Shay. This oh. is your call. <laughs> no, it's everybody's. <laughs> it's, it's all of our, it's all of our, uh, all of our calls. So go ahead, I'll, I'll add in any gaps. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to recognize in human healthcare, and um, actually, in, you know, sitting here with Mark on the call as well, um, in veterinary medicine in Ontario, I think we should all watch that one very closely because um, they do allow the establishment uh, telephonically of the VCPR. In human healthcare, in most instances, you can uh, establish the physician-patient relationship. Uh, telephonically. Now, there are a couple states where I think that's a challenge, but in general, um, you can do that. So they've shifted it really to this more meet them where they're at, recognize because a lot of around human healthcare is access to care. And that really drives home the point that, well, if it's all about access to appropriate quality healthcare, how could we limit it by the fact that you have to go in and have an in physical, in present sort of visit? Um, veterinary medicine has a ways to go on that. Um, as you've seen all the dialogue that's happening there, um, hopefully we can get to a place where we aren't prohibiting people to get access to care. We're still doing it with good quality measures. At the end of the day, physicians and veterinarians still have to use professional judgment, right? So no matter when it gets established, they do actually have to use their professional judgment on, can I deliver the appropriate service for this patient at this point in time? Uh, but, you know, it's very clear what the, what the state laws and what the federal regulation says today and in veterinary medicine, um, it is different. You, you cannot establish that uh, from a telephonic perspective. And the other thing, too, with human medicine, their whole driving force or one of them behind telemedicine is doing everything they can to actually lower costs. So yes. how can we make cost of care more efficient? And this is, this is a delivery model that allows for that, whereas in veterinary medicine, we're coming from the perspective, how do we keep costs up? How do we not lose revenue? How do we not lose clients? So there's, you know, the, there's two different models. One is driven by you know, revenue saving and the other is by revenue taking. So that, that adds a little bit of a disparity there. To the point though, like you know, for those of us who are VIS, Dr. David Hayworth was talking about the opportunity of care at lower levels of the veterinary food chain too, basically, right? So. If you look at um, telehealth or connected care, there's a huge opportunity there as well to serve um, you know, a less well um, financially endowed population. So really it, it's a huge spectrum of opportunity, I think for veterinary medicine to, to tap into. Um, we just have to figure out how to harness it so that it makes sense and people are aware of what its limitations and, and benefits can be. And to that point, I think it's May 23rd, Catherine, that uh, Lori Teller is going to join us and talk about the AVMA's perspective on the VCPR, which should be an interesting part of the conversation as well, totally understanding where they're coming from, you know, as, as Dr. Dodd was sharing with us on um, how those parameters are being set up. But it, I think it's the 23rd of May. It is. Good memory. I'm very yeah, Hi. Boom. Every once in a while, it comes back to me. Um, but yeah, for those of you on the call who are interested in just hearing that perspective, because many of us have been in this conversation together and there have been a lot of discussions of where, where must we draw the line or where is the line being drawn, maybe unnecessarily, especially with regard to access to care for people who um, would love to have a resource to help them determine if they really do need to go spend, spend the money for a particular situation. So many variables. If, if I might, um, it would probably be worthwhile clarifying um, how Ontario uh, sees this VCPR thing. Um, you're absolutely right, Chad. Uh, you know, in Ontario, our state board, if you will, it's the College of Veterinarians of Ontario, um, does accept uh, a VCPR being established over the telephone or any other telephonic means. Um, it, they, they look at it as a contract. They look at it as, I have just contracted with you as a veterinarian um, to provide services for me. The caveat here is the bylaws still are very clear on the fact that uh, to prescribe or diagnose, there must be a physical exam. 
And so they do have to have physical contact with the pet to be able to do those key services. And so those, those folks in Ontario um, who are currently practicing telehealth, um, you know, they require their facility to be inspected. And so the College of Veterinarians have, has set up a new, you know, uh, facility establishment guidelines for a telehealth uh, service. Uh, so there's that. And, you know, they are really basically just triaging here, even though we're getting a lot of publicity that we can set up a VCPR without, um, you know, without meeting the client, but that that is the reality of it. So it isn't really that much different, um, but it is at least a step <laughs> in the yeah. right direction, in my opinion. Yeah. That's the big thing, Mark, is it's a step. It's yeah. a step in the direction of really trying to connect with where the, because at the end of the day, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to close that gap that is actually starting to pull apart some of that dialogue and that relationship. And if we can do that, this, this is, it's, it's baby steps. But I think in this instance, if we want to advance medicine as a whole, um, including veterinary medicine and human medicine, uh, I think we have to consider that. So um, yeah, thanks for that clarification as well. Sorry, anything see else? Catherine but... looking at the clock. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, you know me, I'm like, watch, make sure I'm being careful. I've already time to go. How long do we get to go? <laughs> well, I could talk about this for hours, so I'm in no rush. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many interesting aspects to it. Um, uh, you know, again, there could be separate conversations on any not one of these areas. What do we call it? How do we talk about it? I mean, do we look at the Walmart aspect? How do we approach you know, how do we try to encourage the veterinary profession to look at the delivery of care in an outside the box kind of perspective, as opposed to, you know, the traditional inside the box that, that people are forced to come to um, for the care. But you think about how we are also connected via our phones and, um, you know, we all rush to Dr. Google and WebMD. So how do we, how do we take advantage of those, the tendencies of the pet owners and, and make it work for, you know, for us in veterinary medicine today? So, um, I just found a lot of the, the take back from the HTA um, fascinating from the perspective of the, the slow boat that human medicine is making that turn and setting some examples for us or not you know, as we go forward ourselves. I guess one of my biggest questions is what are they dealing with that we haven't thought of yet? So, you know, we've been very focused in getting our at least this up and running. We are talking about the how to name it, what to call it, but what is it that human medicine is dealing with that we haven't thought of yet? Or is their biggest hurdle right now? I guess would be one of my big questions. Um, and I'm just curious if they addressed any of that. It's probably a very loaded question, but I'm just curious what, <laughs> what you guys have on that. I think one of their biggest hurdles is the, is the um, payer provider uh, that, they're, that they're still trying to work through, which we don't really have at this point. Uh, that's an interesting question to think of it from the perspective of what are they, what haven't they done yet that maybe we could do and uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be thinking on that one. <laughs> you know, an example that came up was, you guys may be familiar, so Kaiser Permanente, they're probably one of the largest providers of healthcare services. Um, they actually have individuals that are physicians that work within their network that really don't believe that they do this thing called telemedicine. Because what they're essentially doing is they're delivering care to their patients the way that they see best to deliver that care. Now, it happens to be that a good portion of it is done through what we would call telemedicine consults. So video consults, asynchronous type consults, texting, emailing, those sorts of things. Um, but they really see it as it's ingrained. Uh, and a couple of the, the, the lecturers actually talked about the fact that we need to start this dialogue in the schools and we need to be thinking about integrating it into that level of education because it is not just the future it, it's happening now uh, so i think if, if i were to reflect back on things maybe i picked up to try and answer that question um, embracing it i think is probably and, and the sooner you can do that probably the, the more success you're going to have it's um, funny you say that, Chad, because my sister actually works for Kaiser, and so uh -huh. she was 
telling me um, that they needed some medical care for her son. And never once did she refer to it as telemedicine. Instead, she said, they know it'd be too much of a drive for us to go to this doctor. Yes. So they just met with us via uh, a video chat. And so in her mind, it was they were just delivering the care to save them from having to drive and sit in the waiting room that yes. they were more like on demand to help them to be more efficient. And I thought that was really interesting. Never once did she refer to it as telemedicine. It's just like they really understood it was too long of a drive for us. Yeah. yeah. And they're okay. delivering care. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. And yeah. One of the things that the, 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 the big cheese at, at Kaiser said how we get Kaiser members for life is <laughs> right Chad that that was that was you know and think about it how do we get patients for life how can we keep clients for life and the magic magic sauce for Kaiser was it said the way we get patients for life is to ensure that within the first 18 months of membership they have a telehealth consult and they access their patient portal when they do those two things their Kaiser fans forever that they that they never leave their system. So if we can take that single thought and apply that to our own patients, I mean, right? <laughs> it's it's hmm. it, that's that seems like a pretty simple concept. Side the box. Yeah. yeah. Well, it goes to what Carrie says always about that. This is consumer the consumer driven world now, isn't it, Carrie? And and we can get them to be moving faster and into yeah. That, you know, well, it's it, it's interesting that those two things are both uh, technology oriented. Yes. So, yep. you know, and I think the next thing will be uh, probably a wearable. Yeah, that's the nat that's the natural evolution of where it takes you to. Um, there was a, an example to, to Mark's point about technology. Um, many people probably realized that a few years ago, Amazon stepped in and said, "We're going to really be involved in healthcare." Right. Um, they're continuing down that pathway, but they also took a step back a little bit just recently. Um, and part of that was because they realized that some of the technology wasn't really ready. The data infrastructure, the EHR systems, they really were not structured in a way that allowed a company like an Amazon to come in and help leverage that to continue down the path of consumerism. Um, it will get there eventually, and I think we're starting to see a lot of that. Uh, but that fundamental guiding principle of, and, and you can look across any industry that we live in today, it's all about the consumer. Mm -hmm. And they are driving, whether you like it or not, they are driving these initiatives. And interestingly enough, this was the 25th anniversary of the ATA conference, oh, wow. which means it's been going on a lot. Exactly. Oh, wow. Right? Wow. Yeah. 25 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. That's you, you, you know what you know what's really accelerated it recently because the people paying for the services the insurance companies the government we, we didn't talk a whole lot about the government here today did we um, <laughs> they're a pretty big employer they have a lot of healthcare expenses for a lot of people uh, they're finding ways to cover this thing we're calling virtual care and why for the fundamental reason they realize it lowers costs, but also mm -hmm. creates access to care. Fascinating mm -hmm. to watch what the VA is doing. Fascinating to watch what all of our government agencies across the Department of Defense are doing. Because think about that. They may not have the ability to, without using technology, to create that bridge to that consumer of healthcare services. Um, so I think, you know, it is, this is, it's a consumer driven aspect and we can either be part of it or we can let the consumer go elsewhere to find access to that care. I don't know where they would go, but um, they're going to be frustrated no matter what. Well, won't it be fun if a year from now we do another one of these and we talk about what the takeaways are from the 26th annual. Let's you know. look at now. <laughs> yeah, it would, be really, it would be very interesting to see not only what they're talking about at ATA 19, but how have we been able to pull veterinary medicine along a little bit? You know, what kind of accomplishments do we have in our own profession and Maybe there'll be a couple places where we will be ahead of the curve. Um, Were any animal health companies uh, speakers or, or, or any of that? Was there any animal health on stage? Not on stage. There were five veterinarians present, I believe. Is that correct, Shay? Uh, yes. And yes. seven of us, us all together. Yeah. Wow. In, or, uh, yeah. Adrian is not a veterinarian and Deb Leon is not a veterinarian. Yeah. So we're going to double the number. We're going to double the number by <laughs> 2019. Yeah. 
It was Maybe we'll get wild and we'll make it exponential. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Uh, you know, wild. internal um, guerrilla marketing while we were there. So, <laughs> yeah, ch check our LinkedIn posts and others. You'll see some guerrilla marketing tactics. Yeah. Well, so I will provide this with a couple of uh, tidbits that we'll follow up with all of you guys too. So, sorry, Catherine, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware to watch for our thank you follow up email because there'll be a couple of um, um, a fun little infographic that where Shay collected some of her her key thoughts. Take well, yes, there we go. There she is showing it right now. So, everyone everyone goes home with a prize today. So that's what I mean. I made a present. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of chat in the chat with regards to fees and coverage, et cetera. Is there a, a chart that exists somewhere that explains what every insurance company covers? That's probably too lofty of a dream, but I'm just curious because there's a lot, even uh, Bruce just put one in there too, saying, you know, what is covered, what isn't covered, and are our companies covering that very clearly when they're having conversation? On the human side or the veterinary side? Well, for, for, I would say on the veterinarian side, because nationwide and ASPC are what Bruce just brought up. I mean, I, I think that comes down to, I mean, there's no organized way of delivering this care. So I think it comes down to what, what the veterinarian wants to charge. I think the important thing is knowing that you can charge for it and clients are okay with that charge. Uh, you know, we provide quality of life teleconsults and it's strictly around quality of life. It's not diagnosing, prescribing, anything to do with the medical end of it, just the hand-holding end of it. And clients pay $300 for a consult. So it's, it's virtual, it's in, you know, it's, it's just like this. And people are, people are wanting it. So it's, I don't think there's a set structure of how we should charge or, or such. Um, you know, one of the things I recommended to other practices was charge it like a like a regular recheck exam you know they get the added they get the added benefit of it being a uh, uh a convenience factor so and my dogs are gonna go really crazy in a second so i'm gonna mute um, they like they must like the idea so um some of you i know we have a very intent audience here i can see by your faces but a couple of you haven't mm -hmm. spoken up yet does anybody have anything they want to Add or jump in. I'm like, I know, you know, Stephen and Jess and Robert from you guys' businesses. Are there anything from your perspective that you would throw into the conversation here? Uh, I mean, for for me, can you hear me? I'm not sure if this yeah. is. Uh -huh. okay. um, yeah. I mean, for me, just like Shay, I could talk about this all day for hours because um, this is all that I do anymore. And we provide telemedicine with a VCPR at a really large scale for our current members. And it has been an enormous customer retention tool for us. You know, we've had people who came in and said, oh, we want to use your service. And we say, actually, you know, you're better somewhere else. But they still come back to us because we have that service available. So even if we weren't able to help them, like with a house call on that day, because we had the time and we talked to them and we had that service, they still come back to us. So for customer acquisition, customer retention, it's really been enormous. Um, and like Shay was saying earlier, uh, we see it not as people coming in wanting a diagnosis or treatment or prescription immediately, but more because it is a very low barrier, no payment option. They'll come into us with these little itty bitty things. So we're able to intervene incredibly early uh, and use it for rechecks too. I mean, this morning I literally sat on a video while someone unbandaged their dog's paw for me and we, you know, talked about it. And so the the things that we've been able to do for our patients has been completely enormous. And I am, always happy to talk to anybody who's curious about implementing it because it's my full-time job now is providing telemedicine for our members and so we have a lot of uh, experience in the the good and the bad <laughs> behind it so i um, happy to to chat on that if anyone would want to yeah not oh, I was go ahead Jay. Your your point, and that's what I was trying to trying to to eloquently get so and to get to and miss the mark on that one. But the point of of being able to do that was one of the takeaway comments um, was that consumers are looking to the opportunity to make a wiser next choice, and that is such a, a key point to to all of this that they're they're just looking for what makes the most sense to do next. And like with Fuzzy, if they're able to get that through them, people are going to continue to go 
through them because of that amazing service they provide. So it's a matter of, you know, I think doing this and recognizing this so that you don't get tilled under by everyone else who's going to be doing this. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned earlier something around um, the human health care, having a recognition that the most important thing is that people have access to care. And that's something that we've always been focused on as well. Um, you know, you look at the percentage of healthcare spending as, or the healthcare spending as a percentage of GDP for at least human healthcare, right? And today it's almost 18% of our GDP. It cannot be 100% of GDP, right? Raising fees is not uh, a sustainable solution. Um, you know, Mike Dix talked about raising fees faster than the rate of inflation as being a reason that uh, consumers are no longer seeking out veterinary care as much as they used to. Um, and I think, you know, the, the concept of this creative destruction is something that we all need to be thinking about a lot in the veterinary profession as to how can we not follow human health care in that, you know, the ever increasing fee structure as a, as a sustainable um, model for our futures. But how can we actually provide health care, increase access to health care while still reducing the overall cost of it to a consumer? And it looks like Brenda has frozen. She just <laughs> <laughs> she was on freeze, but yes, she uh, did. Can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. I, I can still hear everything you guys are saying, but I, I, it's frozen. I'm just like looking at my face going, well, at least it's not a bad face. I could be worse. <laughs> I guess, right? so. no, it's always good. smile, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Always smile. So I do apologize for that. I, I don't know what happened here, but anyway, we are reaching that, um, end of the 50, the, about, we're about 50 minutes in here too. So I guess we probably should call Catherine for uh, any last questions before we wrap it up. Permanently unfreeze. <laughs> and I have one, one more comment that if there's anything on the little PDF I put together of the takeaways that seemed like it would be a good point, a specific conversation or topic of conversation, uh, we'd love to, to, you know, carry on, but maybe that would serve as some fodder for future talks or ideas. So I will also tell you, we are obviously going to continue these conversations. Uh, we definitely have, obviously, on May 23rd uh, with Lori, we're going to be talking about BCPRs. Uh, while it is uh, not specific just to telemedicine, it's across the board. Carrie, is gonna, Carrie Marshall is going to be talking about who owns the medical pet medical records, and that's going to be on June 6th. Uh, John Dillon, who is also here, is going to be talking about after hour care on, uh, I'm sorry, June 6th for Carrie, June 7th for John. Um, so we've got some really good, um, awesome topics coming up or like diving into specific segments of telemedicine or the overall health care. I know Carrie's is, is broad in that regard too. Um, so as you want us to dive in more onto another topic, shoot either Brenda or I a note because we really do believe that this is a critically important topic for the industry and we're happy to host more conversations. So with that said, everybody, grab your mug. <laughs>